It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daphne Miller. Uh, I'm going to tell a little story here uh, of how I first heard Daphne uh, speak. It was about three years ago uh, at the Soil Health Institute um, meeting. And I had obviously heard of Daphne before that, had, had read pharmacology ahead of that, uh, but I had never actually heard Daphne speak. And with some skepticism, I went to hear Ms. Mrs. Miller and was absolutely floored. Uh, and the connection that she has made uh, between soil health and human health. And so that's what we've asked her to speak about this morning. Uh, I will read just a short part of the bio uh, for you, but on page 13 is Daphne's bio, uh, and uh, you can read most of that for yourself. Uh, she's a physician, an author. Uh, she works at, uh, make sure I get this right, University of California, San Francisco, uh, and she uh, is a, a wonderful mentor to students there and trying to bring the next generation that connection of soil health to human health. And I think with that, I will just bring Daphne up and ask you to welcome her. Thank you very, very much for inviting me to Kansas and to No-Till. This is actually a deep honor for me um, and exactly the kind of place where I want to be. So thank you so much for having me. And Steve, thank you, uh, because the thing he didn't tell you is he actually had a long conversation with me a month or two ago, uh, talking to me about his work and about this conference and uh, really helping me set the stage a little bit. And so as I was flying here yesterday, and first rule of public speaking is you have to know your audience, right? You have to know where you're going. I was thinking, what, what characterizes this audience? What is, what is the, the, the core, kind of core um, value or characteristic that's happening here? And I was sitting there on the plane and I said, I am flying to speak to a bunch of rebels. I am flying to speak to mavericks, people who are, you know, leading the way. These aren't just, you know, like every other kid in the class. And I got really excited because um, that's exactly where I want to be, is talking to the folks who are, who are leading the way. My friend uh, Carrie Crum, who's an ag consultant in California, calls you guys bell cows. I don't know if that's a complimentary term or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess it's the, the cow that leads the pack. Um, so I, this is a beautiful waterfall here in Kansas. I guess it's the Chautauqua Falls. It's somewhere southeast of here near the Oklahoma border. Anybody know this waterfall? But it just got me thinking about no-till and how it is this very important thing that m many of you have in common, either you're doing it or you're contemplating doing it on your land. But what it is also is this initial step which creates this cascade of events and really changes your mindset and gets you thinking differently and looking at your farm as a very different kind of place. And I, I'm, I, yesterday I was hearing all the other activities, thought patterns, behaviors that flow out of no-till and um, that get you managing your farm. And that for me as a physician was a very interesting concept because uh, this is, if you look at this room, this is like heavily plowed soil basically. This is where I spend a lot of my week. And uh, there's some art on the wall. I know that makes it feel a little bit more cozy, but this is like a sterile environment, you know? And uh, I have realized that I actually need to get out of that environment and start to cast, you know, do the cascade of working with patients in a very different place, working with them outside this, these four hygienic square walls and actually out in the field, literally, with the places that have a huge implication on their health. Someone asked me a couple minutes ago, why, why are you a, you know, a doctor working in agriculture and on farms? And maybe the best moment that I can pick for 
where this all started is right here. Uh, uh, this is uh, a little three-year-old, almost four-year-old me. I'm telling you how old I am now. Um, and uh, in upstate New York, and that's farmer uh, Paul LePan. And my parents, uh, they were city kids who continually were trying to farm, were actually never successful on it. They bought land in upstate New York. Uh, they homesteaded at various points, and then my father would give up and take a job with the Peace Corps. So I had the weirdest childhood you could ever imagine, going through this, from this tiny little agricultural community in upstate New York to places like Morocco and Tunisia and Afghanistan. Um, but looking at that activity right there, I, I can't tell you quite what was in my mind, but I saw disturbance even then. And maybe it wasn't that I didn't understand that what was happening to the soil was disturbing, but I saw that what was happening to that community was disturbing. Because Mr. LePan actually had to take a job in the local prison to support his farm because he was a dairy farmer and wasn't making ends meet. And I saw farms in this very rural community being sold for subdivisions. I saw kids being pulled out of school because the parents had to move. And so that was a very, actually I haven't talked about this in a while. That was a very early experience. Next experience was this. This is a slightly older me, but still a long time ago. And I am a young intern in a hospital in Salinas, California, which is in the lettuce basket of our country. You know, the fields around Salinas are where they pump out all, you know, the vegetables. We wouldn't have cilantro or strawberries if it were not for that region. And I was taking care of farm workers and farmers, mostly. And uh, this was in the late 80s, early 90s, and I was starting to realize how much agriculture, despite producing this delicious food, was making people sick with asthma and allergies and pesticide poisonings and issues with high nitrates in the water and so on. And I was on the front lines of treating these folks and seeing these ailments. And so these two experiences I wanted to share with you because maybe that gives you a little sense of why I'm standing on the stage. And together they really started to make me think, how do we design a system of agriculture? a way of growing our food on all of this terrain. I mean, 45% of the land mass in this country. How do we do it in a way that is healthful, that is creating health, isn't just health neutral, but is actually making communities healthy? And I realized that the only way I could start to answer that question was to head out and start to talk to farmers. And so that's really what I've been doing for the past decade plus of my life, is learning from farmers. And I find that these farmers have many different labels to call themselves. They call themselves integrated, integrative, regenerative, holistic, sustainable, biodynamic, you name it. And I know all these terms have very specific meaning, meanings, but they're confusing to me, honestly, and I think they're confusing to the general public. And my guess from talking to a lot of you is they're confusing to you, too. I mean, we're talking about practices, and I don't label myself as a doctor. I'm just a doctor. I mean, some people call me integrative, which is, is interesting. But it's the mindset, the way that you think and how that translates into how you treat your land that is significant. It's not these labels. And so as I spent time talking and learning from farmers, I realized that forward-thinking healers, whether you're healing the land or healing human bodies, have very specific ways of thinking. And that's what I want to share with you this morning, are some of those ways of thinking, specifically four of them, okay? The first one is that you think interconnected and not linear. And that is a huge distinction because if you think about it, in agriculture, it's kind of like 
soil, treat the soil, crop. In medicine, we're like disease, treatment, cure. But we're going for something different. We're not just going for crop. We're going for health. And we're not just going for cure. We're going for optimum health. And so these kinds of algorithms, and one of these is replacing nitrogen in the soil, and the other one's replacing calcium in a human. Those don't work. That, you know, if not this, that, if not this, that, this linear way of thinking. And that was brought home to me very early on as I started to do this work because I spent time in Washington State with the Hawkinsons. And they were an interesting couple, Eric and Wendy. They had bought acreage up there and their goal was to grow, does somebody know them? I see some folks smiling here. Um, their goal was to, to, was to grow vegetables that were nutrient dense and delicious to feed their community. But what they realized was that they had bought land. Um, Eric was first generation farmer and he didn't quite know what he was doing. He bought land that was unbelievably depleted. Uh, kids had been riding dirt bikes over it for years and had taken the top so soil and thrown it into the water. So he's a smart guy. He's did his PhD in divinity or something like that. He went to the agronomy textbooks and he looked at them and decided that what he needed to do was start taking soil samples and sending them off to a lab and getting readouts and then depending on what was missing from his soil, he was gonna buy that bag of whatever it was and put it back in there. And um, that was so interesting for me to hear because that's exactly what we do in healthcare. You know, oh, you're low in calcium, here, take this. Oh, your iron's a little low, take this. Oh, you need to chelate that. Well, you know, we're just, we're, we basically test and replace all day. That's what you do kind of in, in conventional healthcare. But Eric was noticing that the carbon, the percentage of carbon in soil wasn't going up, that the, the biological life of the soil wasn't improving, that the lab tests were getting slightly better, but the fruits and vegetables weren't looking any better. And he was getting incredibly frustrated. He was also losing a ton of money to these inputs. And then he was having these existential thoughts, like these minerals that I'm buying, where are they from? Who am I taking them from? And he started to realize that a lot of them were coming from areas like West Africa, where they might have needed those nutrients a lot more than we do in the United States. And he also was disturbed by the fact that there was a label on these bags of nutrients that said, wear a mask while dispersing these. Like, if they're so good for the soil, why do I need to protect myself? And I was kind of laughing because, in fact, a lot of these things that we give to rebalance our patients, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, they all come with warning labels too. And a lot of times, I don't see people getting any better taking them. So Eric started reading old school textbooks like this one by Sir Albert Howard, The Soil and Health. He started to read uh, Fukuoka and Lady Balfour and Sir Albert, ha um, Sir uh, Rudolf Steiner, you know, folks who had been writing about agriculture, you know, 50, 100 years ago. And they all were talking about pretty much the same thing, which was imitate nature. Go look at the most fertile place that you can find and do what's happening there. And Eric started to look at, wow, what are the most productive places on earth? And he realized that it wasn't agricultural land at all. It's like swamps and marshes and tropical rainforests and what have you. So he wanted to start to make his little farm an up in, uh, in, um, in, in Washington state into a rainforest. Well, not literally into a rainforest, but he imitated all the principles there that you know of incredible diversity and um, allowing water to, to percolate in place. And he brought in animals. This is this lovely photograph that an artist did on the farm. And he did this for several years and all of a sudden, the soil test started to really just blast off. And the, you know, the productivity on his farm just started to take off. And he started to make money because he was no longer buying all these inputs and everybody wanted to buy his fruits and vegetables. 
And hearing this story, it was so interesting for me to hear because what he had done was to stop thinking in lines and instead he started to think in these web-like ways in complexity. And by um, doing all these things to his soil, he had increased the macro life on his land, the wild animals that came into the riparian ways and the pollinators and the beneficial insects and so on. He also increased the micro life on his land and he was able to measure that through the carbon in the soil. And at that point he wasn't actually doing bacterial tests or fungal tests, but he could see the fungi just taking off. Um, and now we know, and at that point, there really wasn't a lot of research on the microbiome and what, what was going on. Everybody kind of knew that bacteria mattered, mattered, but now we know that there is this intricate dance that's going on that many of you know much more about than I do. And uh, Michael, I was listening to Michael Phillips' talk yesterday. He did a beautiful job talking about this, this network of, of energy and nutrients that flow from deep in the soil to the roots of the plants to inside the plants. The plants have their own special microbiome to the microbiome of the animals that eat those plants, including us, and then it flows back into the soil again. And we're all talking to each other through those microbes and sending all kinds of powerful messages. He also increased the sort of macro um, you know, life on that farm by changing things. He all of a sudden had all this incredible variety of fruits and vegetables that he was growing. And that influences our health directly. Do you know what the best predictor of a healthy diet is? It's actually dietary diversity, not diversity of different colored donuts or what have you, but <laughs> diversity of fruits and vegetables. And that's been shown over and over again. You can do all these different things to measure a healthy, healthful diet, but the best measure is just diversity. And so off of Eric's farm, by growing all these fruits and vegetables, he was immediately healing his community. And, but then on the micro way, he was as well, because it turns out that when you increase life in the soil, you increase the nutrients of your plants. The relationship is not one-to-one, -one, it's subtle. And this study, for example, showed that it took about six years of organic production uh, with these onions. This was a study that was done in, in Ireland. It took six years of organic production to actually start to see that boost in nutrients. But by the sixth year, because you'd gotten enough microbial life going on in the soil, it wasn't the organic that was the secret sauce. It was the, you know, the, the boost in microbes you actually started to see an increase in polyphenols and antioxidants and immune boosters in those plants, which are good for us. I mean, this study was fascinating for me because they compared the red onion to the yellow onion, and they both significantly increased their nutrients, but the red onion increased it almost three to t four times more. So we know that nutrient density is this interesting dance. It's a co complex dance between the genetics of the plants and the microbes in the soil and the climate and all of these other things. On the micro level, he also was affecting the health of his community because we now know that having diversity on a farm, both in microbes and plants and animals, it acts as a reservoir of diversity for the surrounding community. And the more diversity we have, the lower rates we're seeing of various chronic diseases like autoimmune diseases and even um, uh, childhood asthma and allergy. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. And that's because we think that these microbes are actually old friends that we co-evolved with and that actually inform our immune system and tell it how to act correctly. So when you create a farm that is incredibly diverse, you're actually creating a reservoir for health that extends far beyond the limits of your property. It has a far-reaching effect. So thinking in webs rather than lines, I'll have you guys think about what that means for you on your land. 
Here is rule number two that I've heard a lot of farmers talk about, and I just spoke about it a little bit, but diversity, not uniformity. And this has enormous implications for medicine and for health as well. Unfortunately, you guys are still the exception in the room, and if you look on the national scale in terms of what we're growing in, in this country, it really is about 96% corn, soy, wheat, cotton. And 4% um, fruits, vegetables, nuts, the foods that are supposed to take up half of our plate. That's what's happening nationally right now. So the foods that are giving us the highest nutrition, we're, it's about 4% of what we're producing in this country. But I know this isn't the whole story because I know that many of you who are just growing corn, soy, cotton, are also having an unbelievable amount of diversity happening between those crops and when they're not in season in terms of your cover crops. So that is the first piece of diversity we're aiming for. For example, this is Kelly Mulville at Picinus Ranch in California. And this looked to me like just a scraggly old field of oats, and then he started to show me the radishes and the okra and all these other things that were coming up in there, foods that humans can eat. And I started to realize that maybe this map is actually not representing it so well. Maybe there is more diversity going on than we think. Or here's Kerry Crum that I was talking about, who's showing a cover crop he just grew on a, uh, for in between corn production for a dairy farmer in California. And can you see what he's holding up? A daikon radish. That is gourmet food. I mean, that's good stuff. And it's also incredibly good for your heart, filled with antioxidants. This is food for humans that a lot of us are growing in these cover crops and that could be harvested. So diversity has this opportunity to feed us once again. It also has everything to do with protecting the soil. This is a part of California that gets seven inches of rain on a good year. And this is some uh, soil that I cleared away that was under cover crop. And look what's happening in the middle of August there. We have water. This is a miracle. And this is because of diversity, okay? Um, every other part of that land that they weren't growing cover crops on was bone dry. You just dig down and down and down. So diversity is literally protecting our water and protecting our land. And we need that water to survive. Now, this is a, we're skipping to medicine now. This is a healthcare article that came out in a prestigious journal Call, and this was written by a researcher named Erica Von Mutius. And what is she saying? She's saying the same thing. She's saying that biodiversity is the new kid on the block. We've got to start caring about this, folks, in healthcare. This is what's going to make the difference and keep us healthy. So we're all thinking about the same thing. This is Erica Von Mutius, very respected, serious researcher head of allergy and asthma at Munich Children's Hospital in Germany. She's published articles that have ended up in the most respected medical journals in the, in the world, like the New England Journal of Medicine. And guess what she writes about? She writes about the farm effect. She writes about the fact that kids who are raised on sustainable farms where they're exposed to lots of different plants and animals and very few chemicals, so really limiting the herbicides and pesticides, have much healthier immune systems and much lower rates of asthma and allergy than kids who are raised on conventional farms. And she is finding this over and over again. She started her studies in Bavaria and Germany, and now they're doing them in the United States and Pennsylvania and Ohio, and they've become a huge collaboration of researchers. And when I went and visited Dr. Von Mutius, this was quite a few years ago, before people knew exactly what she was doing, and asked her, what is the secret sauce? What's going on on these farms that's protecting these kids? She went to her computer and she brought up this picture. And she said, Dr. Miller, I do not need to tell you anything more. I mean, my German accent's not so good. But um, she said, it's all here. You know, look. 
it's, um, you know, you got the, the manure and the cows and the milk, which is not homogenized, pasteurized, vitamin D added milk, by the way. Um, but none of my medical colleagues are in the audience, right? Because they'll report me to the CDC. Um, but, you know, this is so funny because in medicine, what do we call asthma and allergy? You know, at colloquially, we say hay fever. But here she is tossing hay in the air and those kids are being protected. And then she actually did something very interesting with this research. She went to the apartments of kids in downtown Munich who were suffering from asthma and allergy. And she swabbed the farms with all these swabs and the apartments with all these swabs. And she went back to the lab and she ran 16 sRNA tests on them to look at the bacterial populations. And they studied the fungal populations. And this is what they found. They found that the blue line, which is living on farms, and that y-axis is diversity, that the kids living on farms were exposed to all of this microbial diversity. The kids in the cities were not. They, had, they were exposed to lots of microbes, but they all looked the same. It's like the kids in the cities were exposed to this, and the kids on the farm were exposed to that. And that really is what was making the difference. And what they found is that kids who are on farms where there are a lot of chemicals tend to look a little bit more like the uniform gummy bears. But this is the part that really rocked my world because there, there's a part of the article where they start to describe the bacteria that they found on these farms. And it's a big article, but look at that first bacteria that's described in italics. Somebody read that out. Listeria, oh my God, as a doctor, I hear that word and I start to quake. And these are on the farms where the kids are healthy. What sense do you make of this? What's the answer? Anybody have an answer? Constant exposure, Constant exposure is maybe part of it, that there is some kind of resistance that develops. But it's, the, it's a whole grab bag. It's the multicolored gummy bears. And it turns out that when you have pathogenic bacteria and it's there alone, it does a job on you. But when it coexists with all these others, there's comp competition. And that's what you see here, that, that, that red line below is infection or infection outbreak. And you see when there's just a couple types of microbes, Whatever pathogenic bacteria it is can go wild, but if there is competition, it can't. And that's something that we see in plants, we see it in animals, and we see it in humans. And she documented this on this farm, and I can tell you that a lot of researchers in medicine read that and went crazy. But it's the truth. It's what they found. So the third rule is dynamic balance. Okay. Now the Californian in me is coming out. I figure we've gotten to know each other a little. You think I'm okay? I'm really showing you what I'm all about, which is goat yoga, right? Um, no. Well, I told you my parents were in the Peace Corps, so you probably expected this was coming, right? So this is not me, but seriously, guys, this is a thing. I'm telling you. People do yoga with goats on their back. Um, but I thought it was a great way of illustrating this concept of dynamic balance because you really do have to use that to do go goat yoga. So dynamic balance, not eradication. That is the third concept. And this is Bob Gattenby. He is actually a cancer researcher in Florida. And he's an interesting guy. He's never stepped foot on a farm in his life. He's allergic to plants. But super smart. And he was so frustrated by the fact that with his cancer patients, he'd whack him with chemotherapy. They'd all be like, I'm cured, I'm cured. And then within four to five years, the cancer would come back with a vengeance and they'd be, they'd be dead. And he said, we are not thinking right here. And so he started reading broadly on this. 
and he was reading about a cabbage moth that devastated cabbage crops. I think it was in Ireland or England or someplace. And they were whacking it with every kind of pesticide you can imagine. And the moth would go away for a while and then it would come back with a vengeance. And then he started reading about some smart farmers who were actually using integrated pest management, something you all know about, but was like rocking his world. This idea that you give minimal doses and really just try to not eradicate that cabbage moth, but keep it in balance. It's okay if it's there, but just don't let it run over everything else. And he's like, why can't we do that with cancer? So he started to experiment, first with uh, prostate cancer, which is still now where he's actually doing clinical trials. Very exciting as of this year. He's got NIH funding to do it, but he's looking at breast cancer. He's looking at skin cancer. Uh, he would like to look at pancreatic and ovarian cancer. These cancers that are you know, becoming increasingly common and that are truly um, uh, devastating and overwhelming to us. And what he's finding is this is that there's really two camps of cancer cells. There's the sensitive cancer cells that will respond to treatment, and the ones that are resistant, like those moths that keep on coming back. And he realized that if you whack those cancer cells really hard with chemotherapy at the MTD, which is the maximum tolerable dose, you start with sensitive cells, and within a couple years, you get resistant cells, which is the green up there. Does that make sense to you? So he said, I'm going to do integrated cancer management, and I'm just going to do little doses, adaptive doses, as much as we need, and I'll follow the cancer with like PET scans and make sure it's not growing and it's staying within its own little field and what have you. And what he's found is that he can keep people with cancer going on for a really long time with, you know, dynamic uh, management or, and not with uh, eradication. And he's realized that there's all of these dynamics which he needs to keep in balance, like pH can control normal cells and cancer cells and glucose and oxygen and blood supply. But this is a wonderful quotation from Bob Gattenby because I think it means a lot to all of us. He said, you know, the biggest problem with implementing this strategy is that you have to overcome psychological and emotional barriers in patients and physicians. Does that ring true for you guys? So many times, making the change, it's not about what's right or what the science shows you or whatever. It's these psychological and emotional barriers. That is really upsetting to me that that's what's between us and getting to better cancer treatments. And I'm sure that it's upsetting to a lot of you that that's between, you know, what's between uh, getting to better field treatments. So after thinking about Bob Gattenby a little bit, I was spending some time at the KSU website and I saw a really interesting story going on there. Did anybody here post this story? Is anybody in the room who did this? This was an aphid outbreak that happened in alfalfa last year. And man, they were seeing 60 to 70 aphids per stem, this farmer. He was going crazy, or she was going crazy. What's going on here? But it was a diversified field. There was other things growing in that field. And they were doing all their soil practices. A couple days, they started to see the lacewings come in. They calmed down a little bit. And then, by the 16th of May, remember this is the 11th of May? By the 16th of May, the ladybugs came in. And guess what? There were six or seven aphids per stem. They didn't need to take out those pesticides. They needed to keep this dynamic balance. That's right here in Kansas. Is anybody involved in this? Is everybody seeing this in their fields? What do you have to do? You have to sit on your hands, right? Is that hard as farmers to sit on your hands? What? Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> you know, I've learned to sit on my hand as a doctor too and let your natural healing systems work as far as they can. It doesn't mean that I don't pull in the medicines, but I see what your, your natural healing can do first. It's the same principle. So, you know, 
Right here is the aphids, the ladybugs, and the lacewings, the same kind of dynamic balance that Bob Gattenby is trying to use in cancer. I spoke about Bob Quinn yesterday. He's a friend of mine. He's a Kamut and wheat farmer in Montana. He's actually organic and not no-till, but trying to get to no-till and experimenting as much as he humanly can to get there. But he told me a funny story about his wild oats, which I guess are a huge problem. They come in, and then you, you know, end up having to use herbicides to kill them and what have you. But one year, he sat on his hands, and what he realized was that the cold in Montana would actually kill it off before he went to put in his wheat, and that it was like the richest cover crop he ever had when he went ahead and, and, till, and, and, and mowed those oats in or, or worked them in. So, you know, for him, that was the dynamic balance, was the wild oats to spring wheat to climate. And what I love talking about these stories is that they always connect at the end between agriculture and health. So when we're talking about dynamic balance in cancer and we're talking about dynamic balance in protecting the soil, guess what? If you protect that soil, it's a reservoir for treatments for humans. And this is a story about a woman whose breast cancer was treated by just a very common chemotherapy, bleomycin, but guess where that chemotherapy comes from? Soil. It is mined from soil. So when we keep our soil healthy, we're actually um, oh, you know, keeping that opportunity for all those microbes that will potentially even save our health in the end. And that, you know, kind of pulls the cancer and the soil together. So, in, you know, in closing, when you're thinking about dynamic balance, don't think of the slide out there on the right. Think of the one on the left. Just pruning, just pruning. Now, the final thought is this one of intelligent tinkering, not conquest. And can you see the image that's in the background there a little bit? I went to a conference in India a couple years ago on the northeast border with Bangladesh. It was actually indigenous Terra Madre. It was an amazing conference. It was um, uh, traditional farmers from all over the globe that get together. I have no idea how they afford the plane ticket. A lot of them are from tiny villages in Peru. and I mean, there were tribes from all over the world represented. And they get together and talk about farming methods, just like this conference. In fact, it would be great to have a no-till in indigenous Terra Madre meetup because I think you guys would have a lot to share with each other. It would be super cool. Um, or maybe you can send a delegation to the next one. But when I went hiking out in the woods near there, I came across these bridges. And these are bridges that are built by humans but using roots that are growing out of these banyan trees and weaving them and they take years to build and they go over these really dangerous you know flowing rivers but they made these natural bridges that have lasted for centuries and what was really incredible to me is every once in a while as I was hiking, I'd come across a man-made bridge that was you know, built by the Army Corps, and it had been built three years earlier, and it was falling apart, and I was scared to death to go across it. There were you know, pieces missing, and the metal was falling off, and what have you, but these bridges were safe as can be. And this is what I call intelligent tinkering. I'm borrowing a term from the naturalist, Aldo Leopold. This idea that you work with nature, not against her. Now, we've been working against nature for a really long time, pretty much ever since we developed steel. We've been plowing up that earth and uh, doing something that you guys are now finally changing the story on. But this goes back to you know several uh, thousand years BC. Uh, you can see in the activity in the bottom. And it wasn't quite so violent yet then, but you know, civiliz civilizations have been lost over the centuries from our plowing, and I think you all have heard that story. But ironically, we've been cutting us up ourselves with that same steel for all that time as well. And these are photographs of the early surgeries that were done. Now, I am not against surgery. If you have appendicitis, you want that appendix out. If you, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, you fall off a tractor and, you know, give yourself a massive wound, you need that open and taken care of and sewn up. I mean, I am all for surgery, don't get me wrong, and I do little ones in my office. Just like I actually think 
for tilling, there might be a role in interrupted disturbance, and some of the research might be showing that as well. I don't think it's an all or none thing. But what we've done is we've kind of moved on to this in the modern era all over our land, and this is our solution for far too many things. You know, as a matter of fact, just to illustrate this, for low back pain, it's estimated that about 20 to 30% of the surgeries that are done for low back pain make people worse. And another 30% of the surgeries do nothing. And yet that is one of the most common things that we operate on in this country. It is also where so many of our healthcare dollars go. And in fact, in terms of issues of opioid dependence and so on, if you go back in so many of those people's stories, it started with low back pain and a surgery that they did not need. So once again, this idea of using that steel and, you know, not tinkering, but really, you know, going in and overriding a system, we have to rethink it. We have to rethink it because 80% of the land in this country still looks like this for at least part of the year. And when you go to studies in medicine and ask, why is it that surgeons continue to perform unnecessary surgeries? This is, you know, it would be the same question that you might want to ask farmers. Guess what the two most common answers in this big study were? We've always done it this way, and we're incentivized to perform this procedure. Wow. So here's some examples of intelligent tinkering. This is Cody Holmes. All he needs is a piece of electrified fence. That's intelligent tinkering. And then you move your cattle, you know, in, a, in the, whatever you want to call it, holistic grazing, mob style, bison style, uh, what have you, around your land. We know that might be one of the single best things you can do to bring back your soil when you do it right. I talked about this briefly in the workshop yesterday. This is like seriously it, um, intelligent tinkering. This is a farmer in, um, in uh, Nebraska who basically took his roller crimper and said, what would happen if I mowed down my rye at a 75 degree angle instead of a 90 degree angle, and then followed it a week later with a, the no-till drill um, with soy? Am I saying this right? I always feel like an idiot when I talk about agriculture. You're like, she's an imposter. <laughs> it's okay. You, you try and talk about, uh, you know, Eurosepsis, okay? <laughs> so this is what happened. He killed it all when he moved it to 75 degrees because it fell at a different angle. And then when he went through with the drill, he was able to chop the stalks at the base at the right angle to cover his soil, give himself good coverage, and have it be dead. So this was a no-chem kill, no-till. And he did it just by moving his roller crimper 15 degrees. Has anybody tried that in this room? Really? Does this not make any sense to you? Do you think this is crazy? It makes sense? I'm telling you something new in agriculture? I'm gonna do a happy dance. I don't ever do that. Cool, well go to this website, okay? Um, this is a farmer in New Hampshire who was just completely pissed off about all the chip, chickweed and lamb's quarters that were growing in his hoop houses and taking over his winter fruits and vegetables. They try and get winter production there. This was his intelligent tinkering. He figured out that in New York City they were paying $24 a pound for chickweed. <laughs> and he said, screw the tomatoes and the carrots, I'm growing weeds and he's making a killing. So there you have it. Interconnected, not linear, diversity, not uniformity, dynamic balance, not eradication, intelligent tinkering, not conquering. I know all of you can get behind that in this room. I know you're already doing that. But we have a problem outside this room. We got a lot of fights going on right now. There's a big one that I'm not going to talk about. 
But there's a lot of other ones too. We got organic versus conventional. We have no-till versus till. We have big farms versus small farms. We have coastal farms versus farms in the middle. Uh, you name it, it goes on and on. Everybody has something they're doing that they're pissed off that someone else is not doing or doing something else. And we're in a terrible mess in this country. And I actually think that that is reflected in our soil. What is going on with us spiritually, what is happening to us in terms of connection and community, this schism that we are feeling. And I believe that the solution is in us getting together and uniting health and soil. I know that sounds crazy, but it's something that actually everybody can agree on. It doesn't matter your faith, your gender, your color, your whatever. We all want healthy soil and we all want healthy people. And so I think this is where we really have to find common ground and start to work together. And it starts with you because I want you to all leave this room as health ambassadors. Please, that is my request. You need a toolkit, okay? And there's three things in that toolkit. The first is a set of knee pads, all right? And the reason is this. I know that some farmers just don't want to get on their knees, and so maybe it will help them. So you go to the farmers in your community that don't see quite you know, the way you're seeing right now, and you give them those knee pads. And then you bring them over to the healthiest land you can find. It's probably going to be your land, not their land and you tell them to kneel down, okay? And what's happening is that all those microbes in the soil we know now actually affect your thinking and your mood and your outlook. There is actually a link between soil microbes and maybe it's that they get in your gut and they influence the vagus nerve and then the serotonin in your brain. No one quite knows how it works yet, but this is being studied in medicine right now. There's one microbe in particular, M. vaca, that really seems to counteract depression. So you tell those farmers to get on their knees and that what they're gonna start to get is some psychotherapy, okay? And that is how they're going to start to change your outlook. The next thing is you've got to buy a pack of tidy whities How many of you have been doing your tidy whitey tests? All right. How many of you don't know about the tidy whitey test? Oh, very few of you. Okay. Yeah, so you've got to do your soil, your undies test. You've probably all heard from Bill Robertson, who's fantastic. He is the, the soil your undies evangelist. He's a cotton uh, agronomist in uh, Arkansas, and he's taught me an awful lot. Um, do you all know the backstory on Bill, by the way, the reason he has that beard? I was, uh, I was telling Willie yesterday. He, uh, he got cancer, um, and he actually grew out his beard in solidarity. It was breast cancer. And he grew out his beard in solidarity with all these women who grew out, you know, who, um, you know, need hair for their, for their wigs when they lose their hair from chemotherapy. So that was his activity. But then he just became the bearded guy. Um, and he talks very openly about this experience of getting cancer because it really is what changed his way of farming and of seeing the soil. Um, I think a lot of you might have had some kind of experience like that. Um, I imitated Bill and did my own soil urundies test in my little garden in, in, San, in Berkeley, and I was proud to say that it worked there too. In my uh, little vegetable patches, which I treat with lots of organic matter, and the, and the control was in just the dirt walkway of my garden where nothing happens. So you get them on your knees, you do the soil urundies test where you put one pair of underwear in your field and one in their field so that they can see the difference. And then you get out your little cards and you start to show them. And you say, look, this is the third thing that's in your kit. The cross-section of skin is exactly like the cross-section of soil. Not just in how they look, but in fact how they function. How the water and the nutrients flow and where the microbes exist in the different layers and the work that the microbes do to protect you. It's exactly the same. And a cross-section of the intestine is pretty similar to a cross-section of soil. This is because 
nature is incredibly thrifty, and when she finds a good design, she just makes it over and over and over again. And one of these is the roots of plants, and the other one is the vasculature of our kidneys. Can you tell which is which? They kind of look exactly the same. And on an electron microscope level, one of these is the villi of our intestines interacting with microbes, and the other one is the roots of plants interacting with microbes. The processes are exactly the same, and that is because we are soil. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daphne. We're going we're gonna to take a few questions in here. Uh, and Daphne will be outside of this room uh, after we break uh, with uh, pharmacology for sale and, and perhaps uh, an autograph within that book. But let's start uh, with questions. I'm doing a workshop later, and I know it's hard to think. We can actually take some time during the workshop to answer questions, too. So. Uh, what do you think about... Um, I know a guy, and, and a lot of people in here know this guy, and he's kind of a nut, but he got a bunch of soil off of his native land, put it in capsules, and he takes one every day. He's sitting he in the room. <laughs> he introduced himself to me yesterday. Um, so, uh, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I honestly, considering the sterility of, you know, the food that you buy in the market, it, it certainly could be a good counterbalance to that. I, d I think, you know, if you know your soil and you feel comfortable with what's in it, go ahead and, you know, give it a try. You're, I mean, I'm always eating my soil in my garden off of my fruits and vegetables. I don't wash them at all. I mean, you know, capsules, it just sounds unappetizing. I'd rather have it sprinkled on a nice salad or something like that, you know. But... You know, maybe salted soil or something. And there is actually a practice in Japan of uh, cooking with a, a little and using soil for flavoring. So it's not crazy at all. And, you know, we know with pica, which is this um, iron deficiency uh, that can happen with pregnant women, what do they do? They go out and they eat soil. Um, and uh, in native communities, that's actually been a tradition for a very long time to get nutrients from soil. It's just, the problem is that so much of our soil is contaminated, you know, and uh, also uh, depleted that it really has to be soil you trust. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you the same answer I give for raw milk. People are like, do you, are you, do you believe in raw milk as if raw milk were a religion or something? And I'll say, you know, if it's coming from your cows and your sheep and your goats and you know how it's been cared for, go for it. If it's just mystery raw milk in the market, nah. You know, it, not, not so good. Daphne, uh, right here. Yeah. So, as we were talking last night, and, and you talked about this a while ago, as a doctor, you see patients come in. Uh, you were talking about us sitting on our hands with, if we have an infestation of aphids waiting on Mother Nature to take care of it. And when we try to uh, tell other people about that, you know, they kind of panic and, you know, you, we got to do so. Do you see that in your patients when you say we, we need to wait and see if, or how, how do you... So see I see it much thing? more in my colleagues than my patients. My patients actually believe in their bodies. They, a lot of them, when I tell them that they can heal, they actually believe it. And I say, I'm here with you, and we're going to check in tomorrow and the next day. And if things are going off the rails, we can you know, swoop in and intervene. But let's see how things go for you. And I do it you know, for certain things. If it's an overwhelming infection, I mean, don't get me wrong. I use drugs. I use surgeries. I don't want you to walk out of this room thinking I'm, you know, uh, you know, not using those uh, conventional treatments. I just use them in an integrated way, in the minimum dose possible, and only when really necessary. I use a sliding scale of evidence for when they're needed. And what I found, because I teach a lot of young doctors, I, I have to literally sit on their hands. 
um, and to keep them from doing things. They just can't believe that someone would come in to see them and would not leave a, with a prescription for something or a referral to a surgeon or something. And that's just, you know, how we've been indoctrinated. And I know that as farmers, you're the same. You feel like you got to do something, you know. <laughs> and sometimes doing nothing is doing something. That's the hardest part sometimes, keeping white. Yeah. But, but at the same time, you do have that toolbox to be able to swoop in. You know, and if those 60 aphids went to 120 aphids the next day, um, then, you know, that's a different story. But if you're starting to see this pattern of improvement, you know, and that's a lot of what has to go on too, is we have to learn as healers to trust our intuition and to be able to look at nature and recognize the pattern. I think that companies, chemical companies, and our educational system have dumbed us down to the point where we don't trust our healing intuition anymore. And that is a piece of this. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to let the folks know here, I'm from Nebraska, and I have four trays of healthy rainfall simulator, high organic matter soil, out in the back of my pickup, if you would like to bring a teaspoon out and sample it. <laughs> Let me know how many takers you get at the end of the day, okay? That's pretty good, Dan. Uh, if we were a group of doctors and, and we were trying to convince them, what is it gonna take the medical community to see what you're saying because it's so based upon referee journals, medical case studies. What you're saying makes sense, but if I'm a doctor, what's it gonna take for the training of future doctors, the medical community? It's, what's that saying? It's gonna take a lot of funerals. Um, unfortunately, uh, there needs to be a real shift, but it's actually starting to happen. And uh, the younger generation of doctors that I'm training, and even ones who are now you know, postdocs or in their 20s and 30s or what have you, are starting to think really differently. I mean, we are seeing antibiotic resistance in medicine just like you're seeing it in the fields. And we're seeing you know, cancers where we haven't really improved survival rates in 30 years. Like, what's up with that, you know? So we know that there's a lot of ways that we're not thinking right. And there are folks like Bob Gattenby and many more who really, really are starting to think differently. You read the Journal of Allergy and Immunology now, and I'm, I think I'm reading like Acres USA. I mean, there's like so much talk about, uh, you know, biodiversity, and I mean, that's where she published that piece. So there are things that are starting to shift. And the microbiome has made us realize that we are all interconnected in this way that we hadn't envisioned. It's still hard to find doctors who are, you know, willing to be forward thinking in the same way. It's still hard to find farmers who are willing to be forward thinking. And that's why I think we really all need to work together. When you become a health ambassador after you leave this room, get the health people in your community involved too. Bring them to your farm, educate them. I've just given you the tools to really school someone in medicine now and to talk to them about those four ideas, those four principles. And this talk will be posted on no-till. Share it with them. You know, I've got enough like degrees under, after my name, and I'm in an institution that's sort of like respected enough that they at least sit down and listen once. You know, they might walk away and and think it. You know, but it is amazing how minds really are changing. Over here. Does vitamins and mineral supplements help us or hurt us? Mostly, they do nothing. Mostly they, uh, they come out in the toilet. Um, that's the one exception being if you have a real deficiency. And I unfortunately, and because our diets have gotten so bad, see people who really are vitamin B12 deficient, vitamin D deficient, iron deficient, and so on. And that, in those cases, you do need to supplement just to get people back to normal. But this idea that you can get to optimum health from, you know, and most people's labs are totally normal. To get better through vitamins, there's absolutely no evidence. And there's a lot of evidence that, in fact, high doses of certain vitamins can bring on cancer. Like, you know, high doses of B vitamins actually increase the risk of lung cancer. And there's new research on prostate cancer and so on. So 
It's the same, you know, they, they don't make a difference. And you know what? Diet will, if you start it at the right age and eat healthfully, and you know, or at any age and eat healthfully, it will make a difference. But diet doesn't cure most things either, I hate to tell you. It is prevention. And there are some doctors out there that are, you know, way out there who are trying to convince people that, you know, don't do the chemotherapy, don't do it, just, you know, eat that orange and you'll be fine. And that's not true either. So, you know, the science kind of goes wacky both ways and we need to keep it in balance. What are your thoughts on uh, almond products and moving away from um, animal products like traditional milk and things like that. How do you see that affecting, you know, the diversity that, that, uh, that we're seeing? I think that we're just going once again to another, you know, we just jump from one ship to another. And California, the cash crop right now is almonds. It's, they've, you know, uprooted all of these vegetable systems to put in these perennial trees that are using enormous amounts of water and need, uh, they haven't really found a great way to cover crop with them because of harvesting. And they, you know, uh, it, we're, we're in another kind of monocrop at this point and they use a lot of chemicals. So yeah, the answer is not to move to almonds. Uh, the answer is, once again, diversity. The other answer really is for us to start to plant our plates locally. And I have been to you know, the upper outer peninsula of Michigan in the middle of winter and watched farm communities eat almost 100% locally in those regions. We can do that anywhere in this country with preserving and canning and uh, trading and getting back together as a community and growing foods that humans can eat. And that really is the answer. Let's give Daphne another round of applause.